Uh, but this morning I want to talk to you about the book of Hosea. It's been called two things. It's been called the strangest story in the Bible. And there are quite a few, are there not? Uh, it's also been called the second greatest love story in the Bible. And we, we love a good love story that has its twists and turns and tensions and conflicts and a sense of almost hopelessness. Hosea foots that bill. Uh, but Hosea was above all God's last prophetic word to a kingdom uh, that was going to be severely punished. A kingdom that would be uh, carried away and would in fact never return the northern kingdom of Israel. Let me just read to you the first three verses of Hosea 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. And verse 3 says, sort of matter-of-factly, So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. Uh, probably the strangest beginning of any book in the Scriptures. Uh, the last piece of advice you would give to a young man seeking marriage. Go and find the worst possible choice in life partner. Now there are you know, some debates about timing and things, but the fact is that God warned Hosea that the woman that he would marry would, would one day break his heart. But the worst thing was that everyone would know about it. It's one thing to have a relationship that hits the rocks and can sort of go away for a little while and recoup and regather. And... But this broken relationship would be a national scandal. Hosea's family life and home life and the uh, behavior of his beloved wife was to become the talk of the dinner table. But there was a bigger picture because God tells Hosea that he was to take this kind of woman because the land hath committed great whoredom departing from God. So as the, as the families in Israel talked about poor Hosea and what shocking things happened to him and what was his wife thinking, really they were talking about themselves. They were the scandal. They were the unfaithful wife. The scandal wasn't just on her, it was on them. When they spoke about this poor prophet and his broken family, they were really condemning themselves. God's word is really like a mirror, is it not? Uh, whenever we read about the sins of other people in the Bible, men or women, men or women, the nation of Israel, Gentile nations, that of the apostles, believers in the early church and others, it's really a mirror to what is going on inside. Well, let's go over to Hosea 3 for a moment. Hosea 3. And we're told that the Lord said to me, Hosea writes, Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I brought her to me for 15 pieces of, sil of silver and for an omer of barley and a half omer of barley. This was the, uh, the, the, the price of a not very expensive slave. Uh, her, her value on the slave market was diminishing by the day. 
But he buys her because God tells him to do that. And it's verse 3, And I said to her, Thou shalt abide with me many days, and thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. Okay, we're going to start again. We're going to reset this relationship. We're going to honour the Lord. And then in verse 4, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. There's going to be a a waiting period until there's full restoration. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Verse 5 has not actually happened yet. So this prophecy hasn't been fulfilled just yet. But Hosea would go, he would buy his wife back. Why? Because that's what God does with his people. Hosea would act as God acted. What's our responsibility as believers to act as Christ acts? To be like him. Not to be like anyone else, but to be like Jesus Christ. It's very challenging. It's excruciating. It's excruciating to show that kind of grace. Uh, Hosea could have ministered for as many as 60 years. That's a very long time. It's a very long time, and to see at the end of his ministry, God fulfill his word and do exactly what he told the nation, that they would indeed be carried away by the Assyrians. But what I want to do today is briefly, in the time we have, look at Hosea 6, having painted a picture of the story of Hosea, because most of Hosea is God's indictments on the northern kingdom and, to some extent, Judah. And the reason why God details these judgments is not because God delights in reciting our sins, but to show that his judgment is always fair. It's always fair. God doesn't overdo things. He doesn't underdo things. We can never complain at the end that, that, that God gave us a, a bad deal, a bad rap. And so a lot of Hosea are these indictments that come against God's people, which they knew deep down were true. Now look at these first three verses in Hosea 6. These are beautiful verses. Come, uh, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. This sounds very promising, does it not? It sounds very promising. We like the sound of, of, of being wounded and then being healed, having bandages and ointment and cream put on, those grazes, those bruises, those cuts and sores. This, this sounds really good, verse 1. And then look at verse 2. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. And as Christians today, whenever we see the third day, you know what we think of, don't we? Oh, maybe there's some resurrection kernels here. Maybe Hosea is looking forward to that day when Christ rose. And look at verse 3. Then we shall know if we follow, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain and the latter and former rain unto the earth, those seasonal rains that guaranteed another harvest. Now, these verses, maybe you've turned to at times, well-known passages, well-known verses, uh, where God's people recount their sins and ask the Lord to heal them and to restore them and to forgive them and to give them that new life and purpose. These are very moving words. The only problem is that God's not buying them. God's not buying them. Look at verse 4. O oh, Ephraim, probably a reference to the entire northern kingdom. What shall I do unto thee? It doesn't sound like God's received those words. O oh, Judah, the southern kingdom. What shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud. And as the early dew it goeth away. As moving and as wonderful as verse 1 to 3 is, God is not taking the bait. 
he's not accepting this prayer. Do you know, God isn't obligated to listen to everything we say to him. Even when we say sorry, sorry, we might even use the biblical word forgive, forgive. We might even use the biblical word repent. We might use all the right terms, all the right terms. But you know God looks deeper. You know God goes beyond the words. God goes beyond the script we read to him sometimes. And God is really looking for some sincerity and some reality. There's no good confessing sin that you intend to commit later on today. That's just like a speed bump. Slow down, speed up, slow down, speed up. God wasn't buying this prayer of confession. In fact, if you just skip over a moment, if you, go, if you just look at chapter 7, verse 10, verse 10, it says, The pride of Israel testified to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. And then if you look at verse number 16 of chapter 7, they return, but not to the most high. They're like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword of the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. It seems that God's people here wanted a return to the good times without really returning to God. They wanted the peace and security to know that, that they would be safe from God's judgment without really wanting to live for him as their people. They wanted happiness, not holiness. They wanted a change of circumstances, not a change in character. In fact, in verse 2 of chapter 6, after two days he'll revive us, the third day he'll raise us up. Uh, probably nothing at all to do with the resurrection of Jesus. This is, you know what, in a few days everything will be fine. In just a few days, God's going to clean up our mess of years and decades of idolatry and everything else, and everything is just going to be perfectly fine without really coming to grips with their behavior and their rebellion. Well, let's continue along. Let's continue along with verse 4 again for a moment. God says that their faithfulness was like a morning cloud. And I'm sure that any parents here today can, can identify with verse 4. Oh, Ephraim, what shall I do with you? Have you ever said that to one of your, one of your kids? What am I going to do with you? And the answer is nothing. They're yours. You're stuck with them. You're stuck with them. You take them to the police station, they return them to you. There's nothing you can do. They're yours. And there's a sense in which God's people are his problem. They're his. And he needs to deal with them as a, as a loving father who will remind them who they belong to and he's, he will discipline as required. He says their faithfulness is like a morning cloud. It just lasts for the morning. Like the early Jew, you would understand all of these images. It was momentary. Their faithfulness was so brief. I heard a story of a, of a couple in World War II, they were a Jewish couple, who they lost their entire extended families in the Nazi concentration camps and death camps. And as World War II ended, those that did survive were either liberated by the Allies, the American troops from the West, or by the Red Army from the East. You, get, you, you could get delivered by either side. And this particular family who ultimately moved to the United States, they were, they were liberated by the Red Army, the Soviets. And because they had been liberated by the Reds, they always had tremendous faithfulness whenever 
the Soviet Union was, whenever Stalin was mentioned, whenever the Reds were mentioned, they had this incredible loyalty because whatever else happened, it was the Red Army that saved them. It was the Red Army that saved them. And their son talked about his parents' faithfulness to the Red Army. No matter what they did, no matter what came out in the years after, at the end of the day, it was the Red Army that saved them. He spoke about their faithfulness. Now, who saved you if you're a Christian today? Who saved you? What kind of fidelity do we have to a God who never fails, never wrongs us, never really harms us, that cares for us and loves us? What kind of fidelity and faithfulness do we have to God who always does the right thing? And in verse 5 of Hosea 6, God says, here's what I'm going to do. Therefore, I have hewn them, I have, I have cut them to pieces by the prophets. I've slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like light that goeth forth. What was God going to do? He was going to send them some hard-boiled preachers. What was he going to do? What was God's solution to the faithlessness of God's people? His word preached. His word preached. They had the five books of Moses, which they ignored. I mean, how chronic was the disobedience of, of Israel? Uh, remember, they, they enlist Aaron to make a golden calf before the Ten Commandments are even delivered to them. Think about that. Before they even get the law the first time, they're breaking it. This is not a good start. This is not a good start to the Mosaic Covenant. And what does God do? He sends prophets to remind them of what Moses had said to them. What does God give us today? Well, he gives us pastors and teachers. He gives us Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and mums and dads. He gives us his servants to remind us of what God's word is saying. And friends, because God is faithful, he doesn't adjust the message to deal with the problem. God's word is the solution. It's always the solution, whether we feel like it or not. Whether society says it is or not, which it usually doesn't, God's word is the solution. And that's why it cuts sometimes. That's why it's hard to hear sometimes. That's why what you hear on television at 6 or 7 a.m. on Sunday is always going to be much more palatable. It will always be much more palatable than what you hear in a church where God's word is opened. God relentlessly reminds his people of where they've fallen and how they are to return to him on his terms. Look at verse 6 of Hosea 6. He says, I desired mercy and not sacrifice, reminds us of David's prayer in Psalm 51. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. It was possible to bring the offerings. Oh, God's, God will be happy with this. A little bit like a weekly confessional. Some kind of mechanical confessional. So that you bring the offerings. And I suppose if you are, were a person of means, you'd bring the best offering. You'd bring the Wagyu beef. Yeah? The Wagyu beef. Don't know what it tastes like. I don't know what I'm missing. You could bring the best. And God says, that's not what I ultimately want. My son's going to take care of human sin eventually, for all time, for good. I want to see a heart that's sorry for what has been done and that a holy God has been offended. You bring that kind of heart with the right kind of offering and I'll accept it. Accept it. It's the same today. When someone truly receives Christ as Saviour, God accepts that. They belong to him. As we rely upon that sacrifice every day, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. First John 1, when we rely on that with sincerity, God receives that. He receives that. 
Look at verse 7 of Hosea 6. But they, like men, maybe like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. In the book of, in the book of Malachi, God tells the husbands that they have, they have dealt treacherously against the wife of their youth. Treachery is a wonderful word. We should use it more often. Treacherous. We talk about treason, treason, but treacherous behavior has this idea of an outrageous action against a faithful God. Treachery, it should upset us, it should anger us that we could do that to our loving God, treacherously against him. In verse 8, Gilead, Gilead, in the region of Israel, east of the Jordan, defiled with blood. There was personal violence, and whether this was, was actually happening, or you think about the book of James, where James talks about the fact that within the assembly they had, they had killed, so to speak, whether this is actual bloodshed or not. But there was great violence. Uh, whatever happened to love for neighbor? It all gone. But friends, when we depart from God, we depart from each other. You realize that? When you depart from God, we depart from those made in God's image. That's why the first commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then, then we are to love our neighbor as our self. In verse 9, there are bands of robbers lying in wait for a man. So the company of priests murder. They commit lewdness. Uh, this is the language of Leviticus. The extreme sexual sins of paganism that, that have never really left the earth. Oh, they were cleansed for a little while at Noah's flood, but they always return and then they permeate. And they're further corrupted. And man in his wickedness imagines even more ways to sin against God, even more novel ways and more corrupted ways. Until what has become normal is, or what ought to be normal is so unreal, so unreal, it's like, are, are, are we living in a dreamland now or not? No, God doesn't have to respect our sinful choices he doesn't it's up to us to submit to him and to love him and to serve him in verse 10 in verse 10 of Hosea 6 he says I've seen I've seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel I know that horror is a genre of, of, of literature and entertainment, and it has no appeal to me. But I tell you, there were, there were horror stories, and the real horror is when God's people depart from him. That's the real horror. To live, to live a life of treachery and horror against God is, is a living hell, a living rebellion. God saw it. God knew it. He talks about the whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Again, this takes us to James again, where he tells the church, he says, look, you, you, you're carrying on like adulterers and adulteresses. Sorry, but that's how it is. That's how it is. To uh, be on friendly terms with human fallenness and human values, to be too cozy and as one with our fallen humanity and world is to be an enemy of God. We've got to pick our friends carefully. Pick our friends carefully. The closest people in your life should point you towards God. And if you haven't got one or two people like that, find them here. Find them here. You want friends. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, and I trust this is your story. I'm thankful for a loving wife who helps me along the road of God. Thankful for that.
be difficult if that wasn't the case. But find friends, find friends who will help you serve God. Our friends say a lot about us. And then finally today, verse 11, verse 11, he says, Also, O Judah, his thoughts are towards the southern kingdom. This was the line through which Christ would come. God would keep that line of the tribe of Jesse. He would keep David's, one of his sons, eventually on the throne. He says, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you. It's coming. It's coming. When I return the captives of my people. Now, Judah were not in the clear. They had, from the book of Hosea and elsewhere, they they had committed their sins too. They had looked on at their northern brothers and sisters and thought, wow, we might do some of that as well. But God did have an irrevocable plan for Judah, for Judah. And there was an appointment coming for them that Jesus, great David's greater son, through his death burial on the cross, would secure. And there would be a glorious return in truth, in truth. He says, when I return the captives of my people. Uh, You would know throughout the prophets there are these glimmers of light in really dark places. Just when you think it can't get any worse, this light flickers. Little light flickers. God says there's going to be a return. Why is that? Well, it's because God is as true as his word. He's as true as his word. And if God were not to keep his word, nothing would cease. Everything would cease to exist. In Hebrews 1, it says that that God upholds all things by the word of his power. Everything's held into place by God's power and his will. And so God keeps his word, he keeps his promises. It's really not to do with us. It's to do with God. But if we will obey him and, and live for him, we get to share in the blessing. That's what we need to be interested in, of knowing God personally and serving him and loving him and being on the right side of his promises. Being on the right side of what his word says. We can't serve two masters. It leads to inevitable frustration. We'll hate the one and love love the other, hold the one and let go of the other. We cannot serve God and the things of this life. And so let's remember today that if we will come with a faithful heart, with sincerity, we can say in Hosea 6 verse 1, we can say, come, let us return unto the Lord. He is torn and he'll heal us. He is smitten and he will bind us up. We can pray that. And God will hear. And we can thank God that his son rose again and we can know him and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Father, we thank you for this portion of Scripture. It's clarity. It cuts. It hurts. But you use your word to be, as it were, that mirror that shows us where we're at and who we need to be like, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Encourage us today. Thank you for Pastor Peter and his family in this fine church, all those who serve and help. May your hand of blessing be on it abundantly in the weeks and months and years ahead. If your son would tarry, we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen.